Perfect. Wonderful. So hopefully today will be the last class where we start new material. Then we have Wednesday and Friday, which I'll be using to do some review. My feeling is, is that people would probably prefer to see review from the last little bit. Like stuff since the last midterm. That's my guess. Uh, we're, our exam is on the 19th. And the plan is also, like we did for the midterms, is to have some uh, tutorials leading up the exam as well. Um, because I'm sure some of you might have questions that arise after this week. Um, that said, today's the 7th, right? So that means we have 12 days till the exam. So that means the exam's on a Saturday. That sucks. Uh, okay. So we have the exam on the 19th, 12 days. Yeah. We'll get there, no problem. Um, I did tell you that the exam is going to be open book, just like the second midterm. It's likely going to be similar in terms of a mix of ACORN stuff and a mix of written stuff that you're going to have to um, scan and this the whole shebang that we've done last time. Um, the reason we make you do that, by the way, it's a uh, mechanism questions are very difficult to ask by multiple choice means. Some of them like if it's RRS, sure. Yeah, multiple choice is basically the same as um, making you do it on paper. But some questions, yeah, it, it definitely is important, I believe, in organic chemistry to be drawing things out as much as possible. So we're in chapter 10 and chapter 10 is a chapter looking at the chemistry of alcohols and ethers. And we touched on alcohol chemistry a little bit already in previous chapters, notably chapter seven and a little bit in chapter six. We talked about how alcohols can act as acids in chapter six. If you react them with a strong base, they'll lose H plus and become alkoxides and alkoxides are useful for doing elimination reactions. Uh, but we did also say that al that alcohols OH groups on their own are terrible leaving groups. So that means alcohols don't often directly do SN1, SN2, E1, or E2 because the OH group is not a good leaving group. So we need to do something to an OH to make it into a good leaving group. For example, treat it with a strong acid, which will protonate it and that'll be, turn it into a good leaving group, which is water. Uh, another thing we could do is we could convert it to a bromide. Bromide's a good leaving group. And we could do that either using HBr, as we learned in Chapter 7, or you could use PBr3, which we learned at the beginning of this chapter as well. And there's some situations where you might want to use one versus the other that we have talked about. Um, so we said that if you want alcohols to do a reaction, you have to convert it to a good leaving group. One way of doing this, we looked at this slide last class, was to react it with a strong acid, and that will convert it into something like iodide, which is a fantastic leaving group. Um, but the problem is, is that reacting an alcohol with HI, while that might be fine if the alcohol is the only part of the molecule that is a functional group, uh, HI is an extremely strong acid attached to an extremely strong nucleophile, um, there's all kinds of things that can react with a very strong acid like HI, uh, including alkenes, which we've already seen, and a lot of other groups as well that we haven't quite seen yet. <laughs> Won't see in this course, but maybe you'll see sometime down the line. And we talked last class about how, you know, turning an OH into an iodide using HI is kind of like hitting it with a sledgehammer. It's effective, it works, but it can ruin the rest of your molecule too. So we have some more, uh, some ways with a little bit more finesse. And it's, it's kind of a funny concept in organic chemistry. Um, people will talk about, you know, coming up with reaction uh, schemes where you have multiple steps and so on, and they'll rate them in terms of how elegant they are. And they'll say, you know, the yield's not great, but it's very elegant. What do you mean elegant? 
it's, it's a funny concept, but uh, so we're going to talk about how you can make alcohols do reactions in a more subtle way without potentially blowing up the rest. Of and this is by converting the alcohols into good leaving groups called sulfonate esters. Okay, so an example, we take an alcohol, this is a, a primary alcohol, eh, one propanol, and we're going to treat it with this compound, methane sulfonyl chloride. Buy this in a great big bottle, you react it in the presence of pyridine, and pyridine is present here as a base. So pyridine has a structure that looks like this. It looks like benzene, but with one of the atoms replaced for nitrogen. So that nitrogen can act as a base, it can act as a very weak nucleophile too sometimes, but it can act as a base, it can accept H pluses, and it sort of absorbs strong acids that might form throughout a reaction like this. And what it does is the chlorine basically gets replaced for the OH group. The OH kind of comes in as a, like a nucleophile. We are not going to be looking at the mechanism of how this attaches. It's not an overly complicated mechanism, but you guys are mechanismed out enough, I think, as it is. We don't have to add more necessarily onto your shoulders here. Um, the mechanism is well known, well understood. Basically what it does, it turns the OH into this propyl mesylate. This is called a, a sulfonate ester. And sometimes this is um, abbreviated as OMS, where MS is that mesylate part. Okay, and mesylate is actually uh, short for methane sulfonyl. It's sort of like a contraction of methane sulfonyl, mesyl abbreviated as MS. And once this group comes on, this O3SCH3, that turn, that's a fantastic leaving group. Basically, it, this molecule that uh, I've drawn here, it, it essentially has the same reactivity as a molecule like this, ethyl iodide. In fact, it's even a better leaving group than iodide. And the reason it's a good leaving group is because when it falls off, you get that this, which has resonant structures. It has two other resonant structures, very resonance stabilized. And because it's very stable, it's very happy to exist on its own, so it falls off easy. Okay. When you install the mesyl group using mesyl chloride and pyridine, um, that will not change the configuration. It will not invert it. It will not scramble it. It'll retain the stereochemistry of the OH that gets replaced. So if it was S to begin with, you know, if, if the OH is coming forwards to begin with, it'll be coming forwards in the product as well. Okay. So if you think about this overall reaction, you're going to get that plus you're going to get HCl. We talked about how strong acids sometimes are things you want to avoid treating your compound with. And this is why we go to reactions like this. That HCl, which is the other product, is why we have the pyridine in there. Pyridine makes this. So basically the pyridine is there to sop up HCl as soon as it forms prevent it from building up and causing other reactions on your molecule. Pyridine smells really terrible, by the way. It smells uh, kind of like rotten fish, but kind of more of a, I don't know, it's worse almost. It's like, it's like rotten fish, but the smell stays in your nose. It doesn't go away when you like leave. But yeah, it's very useful for reactions like this. Mesyl chloride is one of a family. There's a whole bunch of these compounds and three of them are, are very frequently used. They all do the same thing. I'm gonna show you all three, but in your minds, these all three should be basically equivalent. So there's methane, sulfonyl chloride, um, 
triflate, so it's it's uh, trifle chloride, where instead of CH3, it's CF3. That's an even better leaving group because the anion is even more stabilized. Talked about how anions get stabilized back in chapter three when we talk about acids and bases. Um, and we said that, you know, resonance definitely stabilizes anions. Well, electronegative atoms also stabilize anions by helping absorb some of that charge. So that CF3 helps along with the resonance uh, from the, the sulfur double bonds to make a really stable anion. So you can have trifle chloride and you can have tosyl chloride as well. That's tosyl stands for toluene sulfonic acid. So a benzene ring with a methyl is called toluene. All three of these, basically, you know, you can think of these as just R, S, O, O, C, L. And it attaches to make R, S, O, O, O. And often we abbreviate them, as you see here, uh, mesylate, triflate, or tosylate. So they all have subtle differences in reactivity. Uh, the most, the best leaving group of the bunch is the triplate. Uh, the worst of the three is mesylate, but they're all good. They're all as good at least as iodide. And if you see any one of these compounds, just in your brain, pretend it's this. So if I was to take, let's bring this up. If I was to bring something like this, O, T, S, could you predict what would happen in this reaction? Well, I mean, if you, if you consider this being just the same as iodide, we would predict under those conditions an SN2 reaction from chapter seven. So it'll be SN2 up here as well. Bromide will come in and well, replace the tosylate group. And you'll have this tosylate very stable behind as well. All right, so this is basically just a way, simple one step way of turning an alcohol into something that is now a good leaving group that's very mild, doesn't really affect any other parts of your molecule, and then it kind of makes that OH, turns into a handle, it makes it a leaving group, makes it a place where we can now do a reaction. Do SN1, SN2, E1, E2, just like we could with alkyl halides. And really what makes this reaction good is how mild it is. Okay, it's not, you're not treating it with a strong acid, you're not treating it with a sledgehammer anymore, kind of going in with surgical tools now, something kind of mild, and making that OH into a great leaving group. Okay, uh, another way we can do this instead of using um, a sulfonyl chloride is using something called a sulfonyl ester, right? So this is um, kind of like a dimer you can think of. So this is basically the same thing as CF3SOOCl. These do the same thing. If you make one of these triplic anhydrides or mesyl anhydride, it will react under the exact same conditions with pyridine to turn your OH into a triflate or mesylate or tosylate. They become then a good leaving group, and then they do all the kinds of reactions we've already seen in chapter six and seven. So those are sort of two different sets of conditions that can make these. And then you have your alcohol into a very good leaving group, and you're ready to do what you want to do with it next. So they're excellent leaving groups, very stable, Highly resonant stabilized, as you can see below, um, so they can make carbocations easily and do everything that we, we want of them. They react very readily in SN2s. Again, just consider them in your brain the same as an iodide. In fact, they're better leaving groups. They're, they're more reactive than any of the halogens. And yeah, they'll come off. They'll do the same stuff as we've seen before, which is good. So it's not that new. It's just... Sometimes these are actually called pseudo halides. Because they behave just like a halide would, like an iodide. Um, 
but obviously they're not they're not halides. They're pseudo halides. Here's an interesting article from 2009 in the Journal of Organic Chemistry, JOC. And this is an example. They're making a molecule enantioselective, which means they, they're making a chiral molecule and they only want to make one of them. They don't want to make both enantiomers. So it's enantioselective. And they want to make this molecule odanacatib, which is a, a cathepsin K inhibitor, which is used to make drugs. I don't know what the, what the condition they're trying to treat with this is. But you can see it's it's published by Merck Frost, which is a big pharmaceutical company, and they are you can see it's actually done in Canada. So if you ever become an organic chemist and are looking for a job, you could design drugs for Merck Frost in either Quebec or New Jersey, I think is where their bigger center is. So here you go. Jobs for organic chemists doing exactly what we're learning right now. Anyway. This is the way they make their drug, which is this molecule right here. And what's interesting is, is several of these steps are steps we've already learned. So you could, you know, at least contribute if you were working there and doing a reaction like this. The first step, they have a ketone that they reduce to an alcohol. It's a reduction. Um, they we haven't looked at that particular reaction yet. That's an organic two reaction, but they do it in an enantioselective way. They're able to get 92% EE, which is enantiomeric excess. They're able to make that enantiomer almost like you know greater than 90% uh, and less than 10% of the other one. Then they use triflic anhydride and lutidine, which is the same thing. It's not the same as pyridine, but it's very similar to pyridine. It's to sop up the acid that's formed. And they turn their OH into a triflate. And now what they have is that position has a very good leaving group. So then what they do is they put this molecule in, and that has a nitrogen with a lone pair. And that nitrogen can act as a nucleophile. So that nucleophile comes in, and look what happened. It, it replaced the triflate, 95% yield, replaced the triflate, and look what happened to the configuration of this carbon. The CF3 was going back, and now the CF3 is coming in front. So it inverted the stereochemistry there. What kind of reaction do you think that probably was? Yeah, that was an SN2. So they knew that SN2 was going to invert the configuration there. So back in this step, they made the opposite of what they wanted it to end up looking like, right? Because they knew it was going to flip later on in the reaction. And then they do this next step, which is called the Suzuki coupling, which I don't know when you guys do Suzuki couplings, if you take more organic chem. Uh, very useful reaction, which makes carbon-carbon bonds between benzene rings, adds that piece on there, and then they make their final compound. I don't even know what that is, but anyway, they are able to then make that. So you can see this overall reaction took place in a couple steps using at least a few steps that are familiar to us um, but this is a nice example of how they turned a ketone into a fantastic leaving group in an antioselective way and then we're able to flip the stereochemistry so working towards i mean the goal of organic chemistry or one aspect of organic chemistry that uh, would be a goal would be to be able to develop schemes like this to make molecules of interest and you guys, you guys know like what, 25 reactions or something now? And there are thousands. And I don't know if anybody knows all of them. Um, so don't expect to be able to just out of the blue come up with something like that. All right. Alcohols can behave as acids. They can behave as bases too, right? Alcohols, they're kind of like water. They can... Take H plus from a strong acid, like HBr, which is how we would react them before we learned about sulfonic acids, sulfonic esters. Um, but if you react them with a strong base, and we've seen this before too in chapter six, a uh, strong base like NH2 minus will 
remove H plus from them too and turn them into an alkoxide. So this is a reaction that we've seen before. And you need strong bases to do this, typically stronger than NaOH, like NH2 minus. NaH was another set of conditions that would do this reaction, or just sodium metal would do it. So these are all conditions we've seen that'll turn these into alkoxides. So this is a problem because we've seen other reactions that we like to use strong bases for, like E2, for example, or like that reaction to make alkynes or to deprotonate terminal alkynes to turn them into nucleophiles. Strong bases get used a lot in organic chemistry for various reasons. And if you have an alcohol in your compound, you can't use them. Because this is the fastest reaction. If you have a strong base and a molecule with an OH, it's going to pull the hydrogen off. You have an alkoxide. The alkoxide may go on and do something else. But that's not necessarily the reaction you want your molecule to do. Um, now, sometimes it is what you want it to do, and in that case, great. We know the reactions that uh, that alcohols will do. We have one reaction called the Williamson ether synthesis, which I don't think it deserves its own class as a reaction and its own entry, its own sort of subchapter in, in the actual book chapter, um, because it's very much one of those examples we already have seen from chapter six and seven. Basically, it's this. If you make an alkoxide with a strong base and you react it with a primary alkyl halide, it will do an SN2 reaction and it'll make an ether. This isn't new. This is something we would have predicted back in chapter six, but it has a name. Williamson ether synthesis. Some guy named Williamson said this is a great way to make ethers and it's now named after him. So uh, I actually personally don't like reactions that are what we call named reactions. These are reactions that are called after this person who maybe first published it, because this doesn't tell you anything about the reaction except that you're making an ether with it. It's not informative. It's not like dehydrohalogenation. That's a great name for a reaction because it's telling you what happens throughout the course of the reaction or hydration, or hydrogenation, or dehydration, or substitution. All these reactions that we have with names that are telling you what's happening, I personally prefer. So Williamson ether synthesis, this is just a thin, narrow set of examples from chapter six that we've already seen, that we're pulling out back, and, and we're just giving it a name. And, and not because, why are we teaching this as a separate thing? It's because if you go out there, and are a chemist working in a lab. This is a, a, a well-known named reaction. If someone says, we'll just do a Williamson ether synthesis, you should know what that is. So that's why we're teaching it. Okay, we can sub-reaction in chapter six and seven. Well, if you have an alkoxide that's secondary in a you know primary, that'll be the, the Lukeman elimination reaction. We could, we could do that, but this is the only one. So this is the Williamson ether synthesis. Uh, the conditions sometimes are a little different. We need a strong base always to make the alkoxide. And then you need a primary alkyl halide. It has to be primary because if it was secondary, you would do E2. And uh, same as if your alcohol wasn't primary, it's probably also going to do E2. So you just mix all these things together and you make ethers this way. It's one of the only good ways of making ethers. Maybe that's why it's got its own named reaction as well. But yeah, you can make ethers this way. Okay, so there we go. But we do remember, to keep in your mind, that alcohols do react with strong bases very quickly. Acid-base reactions are typically the fastest reactions that take place if those reactions are possible. So consider this particular reaction. Let's say I ask you to make that molecule. Let's say you're working for me in the lab and we've got to make that for some reason. And I say, OK, go and come up with a method that you think might work. And then you show me this. We're going to take propine. 
We're going to treat it with sodium amide to make the alkanide that you see here. Then we're going to buy this molecule, mix them together one to one, and we're going to hope for this SN2 and make this product that you see here. Okay, that's that's um, not a bad first attempt, but there's a big problem with the way this reaction is drawn. Any guesses as to what's wrong with that reaction? Actually, the way it's drawn is fine. But is that the reaction that's likely to take place if you mix these two together? No. That OH reacts very quickly with strong bases, and this alkanide is a very strong base. So that's not the reaction that's likely to take place. This is the reaction that's likely to take place up top. It's going to come in, it's going to deprotonate very rapidly your alcohol to make this alkoxide that has a bromine on the other side, makes propine, which is a gas, and it'll probably bubble out, disappear from your reaction. Not only that, once you make this alkoxide, it is a nucleophile. It can do SN2s. It could do an SN2 on another molecule, and you can end up making these long chains. It can keep kind of go like a domino, right? And uh, who knows? Maybe that's what happens instead. At any rate, that molecule you wanted over here is not the one you're likely going to get. And so for that reason, this is one of these problems, again, that we're just starting to think about. Molecules with multiple functional groups require a little deeper thought. It's not just like, I've memorized alcohols, react with HBr to do this. That's an alcohol, HBr, let's do this. It's not like that. It's, it's an, that's an oversimplification if there are multiple functional groups. So we have to be careful that the conditions that we want to subject one functional group to aren't going to screw around with all the other functional groups that are in the molecule. And this problem becomes a bigger and bigger problem the more functional groups you add in. So we'll typically in this course go up to maybe two functional groups, maybe three. Think of a molecule like DNA, how complicated that molecule is, how many functional groups there are on a strand of DNA, and how many different things a DNA molecule could do and could react with, and why our body very carefully has evolved all sorts of defense mechanisms to keep our DNA safe, why our cells don't have HBr in them, or HI, or these other strong reactions, they don't have good alkylating agents. Alkylating agents love adding methyls and so on to DNA. DNA doesn't like to be methylated, so you know we have all these defense mechanisms against that. Um, so if we want to do this reaction the way we want to do it, we do have a way of doing this, and this is using something called a protecting group. So this is another whole area of organic chemistry that it's its own course, it's its own field, it's its own discipline, where when you have multiple functional groups, sometimes what you can do is block a functional group for a little while, do your reaction where you want it, and then unblock it. It's almost like if you're painting the wall, you can put up that frog tape, you know, the green painter's tape, paint what you want, protect the part that's covered, and then peel the tape off when you're done. We could do something like that. So, so here's the, the scheme for this same molecule. We have our starting bromoalcohol. We want the bromine to react, not the OH. So what we do here is we protect the alcohol somehow. We put, sort of put a box around it. We're going to protect it, make it so it's not going to react with this strong nucleophile. Then throw the nucleophile in so all it can do is react with the bromide. And then we want to take the protecting group back off. That would allow us, in theory, to make the molecule that we want to make, despite the fact that the OH is still there. It's there at the beginning, there at the end, but we're going to protect it. Okay. So every functional group has a whole variety of protecting groups available for them, depending on what the conditions that you want to protect them against are. Okay. It's, it's, uh, so I'm going to show you the example you're going to learn one example of this. It's important to learn the concept of it than for me to give you 
a dozen different functional groups, uh, protecting groups, and show you how to protect each one and what the conditions are. This is um, the way we're going to do this is we're going to take an alcohol, and again, you can buy uh, things called silylating agents. Okay. And what this will do is it'll convert your alcohol into a molecule like this, which is called a silyl ether. It's an ether because it's like carbon, oxygen, silicon. Silicon is just one element down from carbon, which has chemistry that's a little bit similar to carbon. It's got important differences, but a little bit similar to carbon. And what that does is it makes that OH very unreactive. It's not a good leaving group, so it's not going to do SN1, SN2, E1, E2. The OH is gone, so it's not going to do acid-base chemistry. It's not going to react with base, strong bases like the other ones do. It basically turns that alcohol into something that's very unreactive. It's got two methyls and the T-butyl. T-butyl is important because it's bulky, and it prevents things from attacking the oxygen, like acids. So it makes it acid stable, makes it base stable, uh, makes it stable against nucleophiles, all these sorts of things. It basically just turns off all of the reactivity that we know that alcohols do. We need, this reaction produces a molecule of HCl. So we put a base in and the preferred base is this molecule called imidazole. I don't know why that's better. Um, you see when people develop these protecting groups, they'll pull out a list of like 40 bases and try all 40, and they'll pick whichever one gives the highest yields, which in this turns out to be imidazole. Um, and we would call this molecule we're reacting it with TBDMSCL, sometimes abbreviated as TBSCL. TBDMSCL is tertiary butyl dimethyl silyl chloride. Okay, so these basically just turn that OH off, light switch, won't do anything. So to take it back off again and turn it back into an alcohol, all you have to do is expose it to fluoride. Fluoride loves silicon. So if fluoride gets in there, fluoride will go for the silicon, knock off the OH, and you get your alcohol back again. The nice thing is, is that fluoride, we haven't seen really fluoride used much for anything else. Fluoride's not strongly basic, certainly not strongly acidic. It's not a great nucleophile. You know, it, there's not a whole lot that fluoride does, but it's like, you know, it's like magnetically attracted, not magnetically attracted. It's like super strongly attracted to silicon. It makes very strong fluorine silicon bonds. So to get these off, all you got to do is put some fluoride in there in some source. And this is a source that's often used. Um, so that Bu4N plus F minus looks like this. You have the nitrogen. Uh, plus and then F minus. Basically, it's a nitrogen with these big, long alkyl nonpolar arms. And what that allows this to do is this molecule, it's a salt. Salts normally are soluble in water and insoluble in nonpolar liquids. But those long arms allow this whole molecule to be soluble in nonpolar liquids. So it's a way of making fluoride, dragging it into solvents that are not very polar because organic molecules typically are also not very soluble in water. So it's a, it's a way to make this salt soluble in organic solvents. So it's BU4NF, THF, sometimes abbreviated as TBAF, tertiary butyl ammonium fluoride. So this is soluble in organic solvents such as THF, THF is tetrahydrofuran. I think we've seen this one before. Uh, it's an ether solvent, only very slightly 
salt, uh, slightly polar, and that gives you your alcohol back. Okay. So here's another paper I wanted to show you from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, back from 1988. And the reason I'm showing you this one is this was published by Kelvin Ogilvie. Does anyone know that name? He was the president of Acadia for 10 years. He was the president uh, three presidents ago, because the previous president was Ray. Before Ray was, well, we had an interim president there, but then there was Dale Dinter Gottlieb. And then before her was Ogilvy, and he was president for 10 years. And before that, he was VPA at Acadia for 10 years before that as well. He's a graduate of our program, and he's a very important chemist nationally or internationally because he was the first person to discover how to synthesize DNA. And that's a pretty important step. And he, he did so largely by learning how to do protecting group chemistry on the different parts of DNA. Very elegant in the sense you have to like put the protecting group on, do a step, take a different one off, do another step. And it's this very stepwise thing. And so this is a paper that he published making total synthesis of a 77 nucleotide long RNA sequence. So he's making RNA, which is even harder to do because RNA is, is a more fragile molecule than DNA. And this is his step. You see there's two OH groups on the bottom here, and he's able to selectively protect just one of them using this molecule, which is TBDMSCL, the one that we are learning. So it's protecting that one so he can do a reaction on this particular one. Okay, so then what he's able to do then is react the other one, put the phosphate groups on there, link them all together, and then at the last step, what you could do is add TBAF and then deprotect all of those and you have your RNA. So it's kind of neat, I think, that you're able to take, or at least with these literature examples, you're able to see some of the reactions that we are learning in the course and at least show that these are real and they have real applications. Um, but this chapter, more so than knowing those exact conditions, because I, I could give you hundreds and hundreds of different examples, which are very useful reactions used a lot in the literature. This chapter to me is more so bigger ideas than learning specific reactions. It's more strategies, like protecting something, uh, how, how to deal with a molecule that might have more than one functional group, you have to be careful of just throwing in react like reagents that you know will react on one part of a molecule, but may harm another part as well. So it's sort of a, a next level of complexity. And we've only kind of tossed in a couple of examples, but I think I think understanding why sometimes we have to do these things is more important than the specific solutions I'm, I'm presenting in this chapter. So that's it for new material for the course. That's all we have. In this unit, we have the first five reactions that we're going to be doing. Um, but it's not really five because Williamson ether synthesis was already done in chapter six. So it's not, not new. Synthesis of silo ethers, protecting groups, they're kind of a pair anyway. Putting it on and taking it off. You know, you, you add TBAF to take it off. You add TBDMSCL with the midazole, put it on. And you don't need mechanisms for either of those. You need a mechanism for that one, but you've seen that mechanism before. So this chapter isn't that, that heavy, I wouldn't say. Uh, since this is sulfonate esters we did this morning, this was how to convert an alcohol into a good leaving group. No mechanism for that, for adding it on. And then the other reaction is halogenation of ROH with PX3. Okay. Do you guys want to see any more examples of these things? Let me do some more examples.
so the first reaction we did was reaction of ROH with PX3. So this is the one where we take like that. <laughs> Which one will we get? We won't get both. Remember this one back from the beginning of this unit? Yeah, that's the one you get inversion. And that's because the mechanism looks like this. Um, Yes, Sam, you do need to know the mechanism for this one. So that happens, doesn't change your configuration in that step. But then what we have here is this will attack. It will produce that plus POH BR2. That's why you get inversion, because this is an SN2. This is an SN2 as well. That's why SN2 is the first one we teach you. SN2s you see all over the place. Very common in biochemistry as well. Are you all taking biochem next semester? Yeah. So all these reactions that we are learning today all happen inside enzymes as well. Same eliminations, substitutions, all of these same kind of reactions, additions, uh, not so much protecting groups. Biology has a different strategy to deal with making a reaction happen on only one part of a molecule. What it does is it has a very specific shaped active site. So it orients the molecule in a special way so that the reaction can only happen in one spot. It's almost like a sewing machine. You know, you decide. You, you orient the fabric, and then the needle will do the reaction where you orient the fabric. It's sort of the same way. The enzyme orients your molecule, and it'll do the reaction in one spot. Where when you do it in, a, in an open flask, you can't do that. You put them, it'll react where the things collide, where, where they happen to run into each other. So we can't, we don't have that sort of accuracy, that ability to pinpoint a spot that enzymes have so we have to protect the parts that we don't want to react, have the reaction happen, and then we can deprotect. Or we could take the molecule, take the part we want to react, and make it a better leaving group, like we saw with the sulfonate esters, which was the second thing we learned in this unit, which was taking a molecule like this. Let's use the same alcohol. And reacting this with let's say uh, toluene sulfonyl chloride and then pyridine. Pyridine is the base. It's there to grab 
the HCl that's produced. This turns the alcohol into a pseudo halide, which is the tosylate group. And now if we took this, and let's say we react this with a very strong base. Let's say we use What reaction is this going to do, do you think? Bulky alkoxide. This is going to do E2, right? Speed it up a little by using heat. And this is actually going to give us a mix of give us a mixture of those two. What would happen if you didn't do that? If you didn't make the tosylate first? Strong base probably deprotonate the alcohol. That's all you could hope for here. It's not going to do an elimination because hydroxide is a bad leaving group. All it can do really is deprotonate. So yeah, the, this way of making the sulfonate ester allows you to do some chemistry on there you couldn't do before. So conditions, conditions, conditions. Uh, you have ROH, ROH, you could have something like tosyl chloride with pyridine. You could have trifle chloride, which makes the triflate. Or you could have tosyl chloride, always using pyridine. There are other bases you could use and maybe want to use depending on the situation, but for us, it'll always be pyridine. Or you could use the anhydride. Um, these are all, all, all equivalent as far as you're concerned. Why you John use one over the other might come down to price, might come down to, you know, these kinds of of considerations. I think these are often better. And the reason I say these are often better is because if you have an alcohol like this, OH, and you use tosyl chloride and pyridine, what you're going to get is OTS plus pyridinium plus Cl minus, right? Well, that Cl minus can do an SN2 right away on you. And if that's not what you want, then maybe in that case, You'd use this because that's not a nucleophile. So there's a reason. That's why you might want to use this reaction versus the other one. My guess is probably that these ones are cheaper and these ones are a little more foolproof, but I've used these reactions before. You, typically what I do is I follow a literature procedure that if somebody else has done it, I follow it and get the same result. But it is true, I guess, there are conditions when you may want to use one versus a different one. This is where we're going to finish today. We're at a time. I think what I would like to do in the next couple of classes is dig up 
examples from old exams that bring all these reactions together. That's one thing I could do. The other thing I could do is just recap all of the reactions from chapters 8, 9, and 10. What would you prefer? What's that? Exam questions? Some nodding? Okay. Chapter 8 especially? Yeah. It's funny because once you get through it all and study it all, you're going to realize chapter 8 is the easiest chapter we've done since chapter 4. It might not seem that way now because it's like new. Uh, but yeah, chapter 8 is the easiest one. Lily says, I'd rather you show exam questions. Great. Lisa says the same thing. So we're going to do exam questions. Um, so that's good. We'll deal with that on Wednesday. Great. Thank you, everyone. I will stop recording.